Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to Ottawa to talk about something for which I feel passionate, which is the stigma of mental illness. Um, I come at this from different directions. I'm, um, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist by trade. I've been setting up rehabilitation programs for people with serious mental illness for more than 30 years, and in the process I've met many people with mental illness who by anybody's standards we might say are cured, um, who still can't get a job or live on their own and still get sub-quality services because of this thing called stigma. And so I've got myself dragged into it by consumers who have taught me perhaps the best lessons I know about the prejudice and discrimination of mental illness. I come at this as a researcher. I've been blessed like many researchers in the room to be able to play around with numbers to be able to show what works and what doesn't work in the stigma field. And I proudly come at this as a person with serious mental illness. For 25 years I've been struggling with mental illness that had me drop in and out of school, in and out of jobs, um, in and out of apartments, stressing relationships, having been on medication for 30 years in the hospital. And so I know what it means to have a serious mental illness, and, and more importantly, I know what this thing is called stigma. I know what the shame is when you go into an emergency room or you go in to meet a strange doctor and you sort of crawl into the corner, you feel so embarrassed by it. And despite the fact that I live for this whole issue of eradicating stigma, I keep catching myself doing it. Um, I remember being at church one day in a men's group and talking about my experience with mental illness and Bob clapped me on the shoulder and said, well, you've done pretty good for yourself, haven't you? And I said, no, no, not me. I'm not like those folks wanting to keep a distance. Or about a year and a half ago having to be admitted to the emergency room for a non-psych reason and calling my wife up on the phone and telling the good news is tell the kids this isn't because I'm crazy this time. And so I understand this thing called stigma and probably drives one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about it. And I learned a lot this morning from the four other colleagues, um, Aaron in particular, about what this passion is and how we address it. What I wanted to do today, though, is check my consumer passion at the door for a minute and talk more about this idea of stigma and what research might show. I was asked to talk about structural stigma, and I'll admit up front, this is an area that I and my group haven't done a lot of work in. So we're going to be thinking together about what this idea of structural stigma is. For me, it's the idea that the stigma of mental illness is not just the problem of prejudicial and discriminating people, but it's actually built into society. And so as it's built into society, we need to be able to recognize it and somehow address it. And so what I wanted to do and what time there is together is to talk about sociological models. Now, as I said up front, um, I am a psychologist by trade, so at best I'm a dilettante um, in sociological models. And so what I'm doing largely, like most of my research, is stealing the good ideas from elsewhere <laughs> and trying to translate it for the mental illness issues. What's interesting to me about the structural stigma is that a lot of it makes sense historically. And so where I want to start is look at some of the historic examples of, of structural stigma and segue into contemporary examples and end up with how this plays out in the mental health area. And what's always the most important issue is how to fix it. That at the end of the day, researchers, anybody in this room who just opines about what a bad issue it is and does not give the advocates some tools to go out and smack it, as it were, we're not doing our job very well. Um, I was introduced as the PI of the National Consortium on Stigma and Empowerment, currently um, co-principal investigators at Yale, Penn, Temple, and Rutgers. Um, our email address, I'm sorry, our website address is ncse1.org. Um, there's a couple things on there to turn your attention to. One is a list of the publications we've done, um, especially the various research we've done on mental illness stigma. Um, two other things that are available for free is one is a, a um, guidebook that we put together for advocates on ways to address frontline setup 
sort of consumer-based approaches to beating up the stigma of mental illness. And the other is we put together all the measures that we developed that have been supported empirically that you can download and use for free. Um, right now, they've been translated to about 15 languages. So we're always looking for partners who might want to use this in other areas. What I want to do is put it in perspective first, what are the psychological models of stigma, and many of our colleagues have addressed these pretty well. For me, I borrowed heavily from social psychologists, and so social psychologists tend to talk about the structures of stigma, and they tend to distinguish between stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. Stereotypes are beliefs about people. One of the biggest, perhaps one of the most virulent stereotypes, at least in Western cultures, is that people with mental illness are violent. Um, stereotypes are unavoidable that when you grow up in a culture, these are beliefs you're going to learn. Prejudice is agreeing with the belief. That's right, all people with mental illness are dangerous and it's the emotional product of that. And therefore, I fear them. And discrimination is a behavior. And then as a result, I don't want to hire them. I don't want to live next to them. I don't want to give them the same level of care. They don't deserve the same level of entitlements and legislative support. And that's led to a bunch of different types of stigma, many of them we talked about this morning. Public stigma is what we, the public, do to people with mental illness when we buy into it. And I'm frankly less interested in the general public and more interested in targeted groups. So I'm interested in what employers do to people with mental illness when they buy into stigma and won't hire people. I'm interested in what landlords do. I'm interested in what healthcare providers do, teachers, ministers, legislators, police officers, all sorts of people who buy into the stigma and treat people with mental illness differently. Self-stigma is what people do to themselves when they recognize or perceive the stigma, internalize it on upon themselves and beat them up for it. Label avoidance is what we call a phenomenon that many people with serious mental illness choose not to pursue services. Um, Amy sort of got at this this morning, and one of the reasons why you, pursue, you choose not to pursue services is you realize these labels have a horrible effect, and so you choose to avoid the labels by a choose to being associated with psychiatrists, mental health clinics, and the like. How to fix it? Um, I think Mike talked about this this morning. Um, our group at least for public stigmas, tend to distinguish between education, contact, and protest. Protest for changing people's ideas really doesn't work well. If you're trying to go up in front of a Rotary International group and trying to get them to change their attitudes about mental illness, saying shame on you for thinking these bad thoughts, actually leads to a rebound effect and tends to make it worse. It does have an effect in terms of impacting media. Um, I don't know how many people ever remember a show called Wonderland. It was on ABC. Um, if you don't know, it was on for three or four episodes. Um, in the first episode, a person with mental illness shot at four police officers and stabbed a pregnant psychiatrist in the belly with a hypodermic needle. Needless to say, advocacy groups were upset, and the good news is ABC decided to pull it rather than risk further anger uh, of people like you and I. Education is fundamentally contrasting the myths of mental illness versus the facts. Um, the good news about education is there are relatively easy programs to put together. At the break, a bunch of us could get at this table, put a compelling PowerPoint slide together, put it on Facebook, send it to all our friends. It gets out there pretty quickly. Perhaps the less good news about education is from twofold. One is it doesn't seem, at least in, in, in randomized controlled trials that we've done, it doesn't seem to have a good effect that maintains over time. The other one's even more sobering. Is, is think about this. Is as a culture, at least the Western world, is more educated about mental illness than the history of mankind, and yet the stigma of mental illness has at least doubled over the last 30 years. Um, we tend to believe people with mental illness are far more violent than the data would ever show. And so education tends to be limited. I think the aspirin, I think the radioactive, I think the hot way of changing the stigma of mental illness is contact. Is people with mental illness coming out and tell their stories, their stories of what we might say the way down stories, is the difficulties of their symptoms and their disabilities, but much more importantly, the way up stories, 
the impact of recovery, the reality of recovery, and having a quote unquote normal lifestyle. So I want to slip away for a minute from these psychological models and look at this new idea about um, structural stigma, societal stigma. Some people equate it with institutional stigma. And people tend to differentiate between intended institutional stigma and unintended institutional stigma. For the most part, intended institutional stigma shows up at laws. Unintended is more interesting and subtle. Let's talk about intended stigma. Um, I show this because, as you know, in our history, perhaps one of the singular most shameful events is our long experience with slavery, um, and then what happened after it in terms of continuing to keep people, African Americans, down. Um, as a white male, um, it, it continues to a sh shame to embarrass me to even show this sort of thing. Scientists say Negro is still in ape stage. One of the sobering things about this is that this actually came from an 1890s science textbook. And so even at the time, science perpetuated these abhorrent ideas. So what are the intended structures, the examples of, of institutional structures that have led to stigma over time? Again, in our history, we had these things called Jim Crow laws. Um, Jim Crow laws came after the Civil War, after this period of Reconstruction. It was based seemingly on this idea of separate but equal, that in fact the white race and the black race needed to be separate but have equal opportunities. Um, the reality is, is that people of the time had horribly worse schools, worse health care, um, greatly limited work opportunities, and regularly did their best to try to steal voting rights from them. Um, an equally horrible uh, example from American history is what we tried to do in the form of legal documents called treaties, um, taking most Native Americans and progressively pushed them west out of their ancestral grounds to these things called reservations, often having to have them travel miles and miles to get there, frequently to less arable territory, surely to less holy territory on their behalf. What we tend to do is we tend to view intended structures as obvious as crimes of the bigots, um, which is particularly um, embarrassing for free cultures like mine anyway, is to have these obvious sins that haunt us. Um, also, intended structures, intended stigma seem to more obviously be a product of prejudice and discrimination. Now, perhaps the southern states never saw themselves as being prejudicial or discrimination, but really from the stance in history, it, its intent was nothing other than to keep a certain group down and to keep away opportunities that they deserved. Unintended structures, as they say, are a bit harder to, ex to uh, understand. Um, one example sociologists like to talk about um, is in terms of standardized testing. In principle, standardized testing is supposed to be opportunity for, for fair access to universities, at least in the United States. I'm not sure, do you guys do the ACT and the SAT? Maybe you guys are as always about 100 years ahead of us, um, the ACT and the SAT are the two standard tests people in high school take to get in college. Um, the problem with those tests is that they're highly predicted by elementary and middle school. And so if you go to a lesser quality elementary and middle school, middle school you're going to have a less example, uh, less opportunity to do well on tests, and therefore less an opportunity to get into the better schools. Um, and the problem with poor elementary and middle schools is that those are, those are highly, rated, highly um, shown, highly overrepresented in low SES uh, um, areas, which again in our country is highly um, overrepresented in people of color. You know, the interesting thing about unintended structures is, is this irony is that a lot of times it's based on good intentions, that again in principle the intention is to treat blacks and whites equally um, to give them this equal opportunity, whereas in reality, we tend to keep that group down even more. And the reason that is, is because it's based on um, the idea of group neutral goals. It's based on the idea that the best way to be fair is to treat, again, in my, my culture, to treat whites and blacks as, um, as equal. Um, in the 60s and the 50s, there's this idea of being colorblind. 
um, colorblind is the best way to build equal opportunities is to ignore or, or forget about cultural differences and consider we're all the same. Um, in reality, what that meant is not colorblind as much as being Eurocentric and the African viewpoints were more or less an opportunity to be suppressed. The idea of neutral groups is an inaccurate idea because the reality is that, again, in my culture, blacks and whites are not neutral, do not come from the same standpoint. That uh, overrepresentation of SES, which leads to huge loss of opportunities and a diminished set of networks. Um, by networks, I, I don't at all mean to, to imply that African Americans have a less of a quality of, of friends and family. What African Americans um, research suggests is they have less networks with businesses and the better schools and therefore lose opportunity. And so how do you fix that? Um, this idea of affirmative action. Now, unfortunately, affirmative action has become a dirty word. I mean, personally, I'd be glad to meet you out back and we can fight it out because I think affirmative action is a good idea. But what I want to do is set aside whether you think affirmative action is a good idea or a bad idea and talk about how it plays out um, in mental illness stigma. Before talking about how it plays out in mental illness stigma, what I wanted to do is give some consideration of what um, um, unintended and intended stigma are in two groups and two health groups. Um, AIDS, of course, is, is a poignant example because of the fact that it's come on with such virulence in 20 years. It's also a poignant example just to map how um, intended and unintended stigma has gotten worse and then some evidence has gotten better. And then talk about what's first and foremost of interest to us, which is talking about um, structures related to mental health. Um, structural stigma and AIDS, uh, it's based on a prejudice, it's based on a belief that people with mental illness were unclean um, and or immoral. Um, the immoral aspect is the fact that it was closely um, related to um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender um, lifestyles. Uh, um, the bad news about it is that in the 80s and 90s when it really became a prominent social phenomenon, um, research suggests there are all sorts of laws, statutes, administrative practices that tend to rob people of their privacy rights. Um, it was viewed as a public health crisis and as such they thought it was fair game to put a red stamp on people's files to warn everybody about um, their age status. Um, health coverage was um, hugely inappropriate, unrelated. Um, we would talk about poor parity, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and research dollars at the time was terribly underfunded. Sometimes there's good news to structural stigma. And one of the good news that research reviews would suggest is in the 1990s, um, the quality of care for people with AIDS has improved greatly, has, has the research, and privacy rights are pretty hugely respected um, in the United States. Structural discrimination and mental illness, what does it look like? Um, these are two um, papers we've written about. These are two studies we did. Um, both came out in 2005. One is trying to map the structural stigma related to state legislation, which I want to talk to you about um, today. Another one I'll just skim through is the idea of, of structural stigma in newspaper stories. Um, legislation, um, it, it sometimes boggles me how fast time goes. I didn't realize we'd did, done this almost 10 years ago. Um, what we were interested in is examples, uh, a, a comprehensive um, snapshot of what legislative activity looked like um, in, in um, 2002. And so we had grant support to get some really fierce research assistants to sit in front of PCs for about nine months to document every piece of legislation in the 50 states in the United States. And what we're particularly interested in is legislation and how it related to liberties, uh, procedural liberties, court opportunities as it were, um, how it represented in terms of protections from discrimination and privacy rights. Um, in trying to be good researchers, we actually had two independent researchers look at all these studies. Um, we got only 45 states. Um, five states actually in this period um, admitted to no um, legal activity related to mental health. Um, it yielded 168 bills. And what we we're interested in is what the good news was and the bad news was in terms of what um, legislators were doing in terms of, of uh, laws. What we found is 42 bills 
And of those 968 were related to liberties. Um, the bad news, though, is that 75% of those are related to contracting liberties, to diminishing liberties. In the next slide, I'll give you examples of what that was. Um, a full third quarter um, looked at protection from discrimination. And the good news is half of those were added protections, added examples of how, for example, employers couldn't discriminate against people with mental illness. But 50% were not, um, which in 2002 is pretty sobering. Um, and privacy issues, about 100 out of 1,000 were related to um, privacy. 33% um, restricted privacy. Um, that may not be clear. 33% made privacy um, issues worse. Examples, um, I always think one of the most poignant examples is in the United States and about 30 states, your mental health history is, rep is uh, relevant to your parental rights, regardless of whether your mental health history happened last week or 10 years ago. Um, there was poignant examples of NIMBY. Um, NIMBY, not in my backyard. Um, NIMBY started in, in our country related to redlining and keeping black people out of the areas. Um, there are restricted covenants that present group homes um, and other kind of programs into certain neighborhoods. But again, there is some example of expanded um, um, rights that while the bad news is that some courts, some jurisdictions, some states diminished parental rights, other ones actually disallowed um, ex um, mental illness history as an example, um, and there were explicit uh, eviction protections, the same kind of eviction protections that people um, with physical disabilities have. An interesting example, interesting thing to keep, to, to keep in mind about this when we had a legal colleague look at this is, for better or for worse, there's 928 pieces of legislation that have tried to affect mental health um, um, experiences in the United States. What we don't realize is that most laws don't grandfather out. So unless they actually go back and try to get rid of that old legislation, it sits there. Now, hopefully they don't, um, people don't keep on calling on that, but in the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender, um, we note that seven states in the, in the union um, has a, have arrested people for sodomy. Um, there's still examples of people being um, committed for reasons other than danger to self or others. And so there is legislation on the books that if advocates don't get them and take them off the books are still poignant and possible. And so let's talk about what are some of the intended structures and what are some of the unintended structures that affect the stigma of mental illness. Um, one of the interesting things I'll say up front is that sometimes these structures are only apparent in retrospect. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things I would like to think about you out loud, or I think have you consider in your head um, that we'll address in, in a slide three or four down the row, is the fact that some of the things I might present you might think justifiable, and the question is 10 to 15 years later, would you agree? Of course, for we Americans, we ACLU, American Civil Liberty, Union fans, we always look up here and think you guys, as I say, are about 100 years ahead of us, so you already think these are kind of heinous examples. Um, examples of intended structures. Um, there are laws on the books to force hospitalization or medication. Many times these can be forced in terms of um, situations other than danger to self or others. Um, most states in the union have a, have a statute that says you can hospitalize people if they're unable to take care of themselves. Um, Ed Koch was mayor of New York City, and during the, a bad snowstorm, decided that all homeless people were unable to take care of themselves and went around and picked them up and put them in the hospital. Um, there are restricted work or education opportunities. Um, there are u um, universities in the union that can exclude people with mental illness from the universities. Um, in the state of Illinois, it's still legal to ask when I'm applying for my psychologist license whether I've ever I've been hospitalized. As I talked about before, there are restricted family rights. Um, there are still some old laws on the books that restrict voting rights if you're in a hospital. Um, there are clear in views of incompetence that tend to maintain, beliefs that because you have the label of mental illness, you're not able to work successfully and therefore lose certain protections people have. Um, 
To me, it's always more interesting in looking at the unintended structures. Um, it, it could be a fair discussion, one we might want to talk about um, after the break, whether, the, again, these are unintended or intended structures. Um, perhaps the biggest one in our culture is the whole idea of health care parity. Um, up till about, about eight years ago, uh, insurance did not cover mental health services to the degree it covered physical health services. So, for example, if you had cancer, you almost had unlimited inpatient and outpatient care. If you had schizophrenia care, it was limited to, for example, two weeks inpatient and maybe 30 outpatient sessions lifetime. Um, unfair work prerequisites, there are still examples in the states of having a mental health history um, is relevant towards excluding people from work. I think what's interesting though is looking at the whole psychosocial intervention domain. I think it's probably safe to say in most Western cultures, psychosocial interventions are behind medical interventions in five minutes or less, um, or behind medical interventions by years. Um, Trust me, that's still a problem. Let's get to how to fix it. How to address structural stigma? Um, I would look at it in two ways. I would look at it in terms of advocacy and legislation. Um, advocacy, um, there are groups doing a lot of thought about what's the most effective way to do advocacy. Um, clearly, in my opinion, is people speaking for themselves. I think there are a lot of good mental health providers in the audience. I think when you stand up and speak about the stigma of mental illness, you're actually might be making it worse because you might be suggesting people can't stand up for themselves. Um, there's a huge tension in the United States about families versus consumers and who should speak for whom. Um, the tension in the United States is a lot of consumer groups believing nothing about us without us. And so they would ma maintain, and I would tend to go along with the view that, that they may be better representatives of the whole stigma issue. One of the interesting challenges is to organize to speak in one voice. Um, this isn't just specific to mental illness. This is specific to all groups. As the interesting idea is that just because we think blacks have similar problems, let me rephrase that. Blacks do have similar problems um, in terms of stigma. Just because we think that doesn't mean they speak with a single voice. And the mental health consumer community is really an intriguing group in the United States. We have what are considered consumer groups, people who recognize their mental illness and consume services. Then we have survivor groups. Um, survivor groups have not survived the mental illness. They've survived the treatment. And then we have ex-patient groups, and ex-patient groups clearly believe their identity is defined by rejecting not their mental illness, but their patienthood. And then, as I said, we have this tension between family groups, um, service provider groups, and the whole thing about being concerned about the anti-psychiatry movement. The question is, how should they focus their advocacy? I'm not very positive about the idea of changing the population. I think it's a little broad. I'm not exactly sure what I want the population to do. I clearly want specific groups to change and in terms of structural stigma. I probably want legislators to change their attitudes towards people with mental illness. Though the reality is that's a slow process given the legislative um, uh, approach towards issues. I think what's a much more successful approach is to approach the executive because the executive has tremendous leeway despite what the legislature might think in terms of dispersing funds for, for within parameters in one direction or another. What the approach should be, I'm, I'm not simple. I, I think that's a hard question to answer. I think the commission has been struggling with that for three or four years. I think the approach needs to be multi-tiered. Um, it definitely needs to be continuous. The last thing we can think of is come up with a good social marketing or a good contact program and slap the public or, or employers or legislators in the face with it and that one time example is going to matter. Um, and it, research suggests the only thing that has changed the relationships between blacks and whites in Western cultures is ongoing regular interactions. What's equally interesting is how to address structural stigma, in particular legislation. I think the interesting thing about legislation to me is not going out and getting the changes because in the United States, um, the Americans with Disability Act has actually been there um, now since the first George Bush signed it in 1990. 
To me, the real issue is how do you realize it in an effective manner? Um, I think it's an interesting thing to keep in mind. I mean, if you can't read this, it says, Sir, these gentlemen from the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission are here to explain new rules on mental illness in the workplace. You know why this is interesting is because George Herbert Walker Bush, the first George Bush, signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, in 1990. And it was there till about 1995 before anybody said, you know, this probably applies to mental health disabilities too. And so the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, actually put out a position paper, um, an executive order to that effect, and we got a slew of cartoons like this, um, including a, a, a somewhat compelling or horrible um, um, article by George Will, who started equating mental illness with, with um, test anxiety and the like. What's interesting about the ADA is the proscriptions. I think the proscriptions are a great um, direction for advocates on um, the idea that we need to realize that employers can't withhold work opportunities or independent living opportunities um, because of somebody's disability. Um, what's much more interesting to me, though, is the idea of reasonable accommodations. Um, this goes back to the misunderstanding, the misassumption of group neutral goals. The misassumption that people with mental illness and the normal population are the same. Now let me be clear about that. I'm definitely not saying that they're not the same because one group's disabled and the other group's normal. I'm saying they're not the same because their opportunities they come from are not equal that people with serious mental illness that frequently kicks in in high school and college and the like get derailed in terms of their opportunities and therefore don't have the same entree to the world that perhaps the rest of us in the room did. That comes back to the idea of affirmative action. Again, I love affirmative action, but uh, we don't talk about that in the states because we're run by Republicans right now. Um, the other way of looking at affirmative action, what we call reasonable accommodations, you have reasonable accommodations in Canada? Uh, reasonable accommodations is, in my opinion, affirmative action. And it's based on three assumptions. That one, re because or regardless of a person's psychiatric disability, they're able to accomplish the essential functions of their job. When two, they get suitable, reasonable accommodations, which we'll talk about an example of those in a minute. Um, what is reasonable accommodations? Again, legislators have different um, presses upon them than scientists do, but they tend to identify it in, in large omnibus terms. Um, in American legislation, reasonable accommodations means if, if an accommodation does not cause undue hardship. Now, in the psychiatric field, I always like to have that idea because in the United States, requiring a public company to tear out their elevators and put in ramps is a huge accommodation, but you wouldn't. Ex so when we think of the kind of accommodations people might need for psychiatric disability, um, th that kind of humbling notion that they have to tear out accesses uh, uh, large parts of their physical infrastructure suggest any accommodation you ask for psychiatric issues is much more limited. Some of the examples of reasonable accommodations. Now the problem with reasonable accommodations, at least in the United States, is what an accommodation is, is not well defined. Um, rehab providers would argue these are four good accommodations. One is job restructuring. Again, we talk about um, reasonable accommodations apply when the employee is capable of doing the basic functions of a job. And so if the person had a clerical job, then it may be a reasonable accommodation to take them off of the reception work, you're upside down, take them off the reception work um, and um, put them into the copy center as it was. Um, other examples of reasonable accommodation might be changing their work schedules, changing their work environment, or sick time. Um, let me say one thing about this and then um, turn it over to my colleague for questions. Is the secret to reasonable accommodation is not being adversaries. And the idea is not for, for job coaches to go into the employer and say, you're not providing a reasonable accommodation, therefore I'm going to have you cited for the ADA is to recognize the idea of partnerships. I mean, most employers, 
will agree having the support of job coaches is a good thing, especially employers in large companies, and most people with mental illness will agree having this kind of supported employment is a good thing. The idea is not that an employer is trying to sneak around and get around a reasonable accommodation as much as they're trying to understand it and without being an undue hardship in, um, um, to implement it. So we talked a lot about social structures, social injustices and the like, and so I think it's a good place to end with perhaps in the 20th century, the best example of a person who beat off social structures. Um, Gandhi said, let our first act every morning be to make the following resolve for the day. I shall not fear anyone on earth. I shall fear only God. I shall not bear ill will towards anyone. I shall not submit to injustice from anyone. I shall conquer untruth by truth. And in resisting untruth, I shall put up with all suffering. I shall put up with all suffering. I shall not put up with all suffering. <laughs> Um, stigma, as this room knows, is a hugely important thing for increasing the opportunities of people with mental illness. And so I applaud you for getting together for this effort. Thank you.